Heavenly Father, as we look further into your word and the spirit of prophecy, may we understand what you would want us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, the, and uh, I, I apologize. Uh, I've, this is just nothing but word slides. I don't have any pictures or graphics in these at all. I'm starting with a couple of slides that you don't have. I just added these this morning. Uh, as I woke up and got to thinking about it, I thought, well, I'd better add a couple of things here. But we're talking about the limits of truth. We live in a postmodern world. It took me a while to understand what postmodernism was. The, the current thought is that, that there are multiple truths, not just one. So there are many truths. And uh, do you believe that? I, I, I don't believe that. There's only one truth, one God, one faith, one baptism. But uh, the current thinking is, is that truth for you might not be truth for me. And the word tolerant has really changed in our society so that now to be tolerant and, uh, means that you recognize and accept as equally valid as yours whatever truth there is. But if you say, wow, I, I need to tell you about something, they'll say, well, no, no, I, I believe differently. My, my belief is just valid as yours. So to present your truth to me as important or necessary for me is offensive and shows that you're an intolerant person. This makes spreading the gospel to postmodern people very, very difficult because they wonder, why in the world are you burdening me with, uh, with your concepts of truth? I mean, I have my concepts of truth. And I demand that you, you respect my concepts of truth and accept them as being equally valid. We cannot do that as Christians. Who was the greatest scientist of the 20th century, would you say? Einstein? Yeah, I think I'd put Einstein at the top of the list. Some people might put Watson and Crick who unraveled DNA and figured out how that was. And so who was the greatest scientist of all time? I think it was Jesus Christ, because he created everything, right? He sustains everything. I mean, he understands subatomic particles. He made them. He designed them. He uses them. The, the greatest scientist of all time was Jesus Christ. And so you would wonder when he was here, since he was the greatest scientist, why didn't he talk to us a little bit more about scientists? Paul saying, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. So let's take a look at Christ. Notice here, Christ kept science as the secret. Christ could have imparted to men knowledge that would have surpassed any previous disclosures and put in the background every other discovery. Why could he have done that? Because he was the greatest scientist. He knew that. He made that. He could have unlocked mystery after mystery. He could have concentrated around these wonderful revelations, the active, earnest thought of successive generations till the close of time. Amazing concept. He could have just thrown out some ideas and we would still be working on them today, trying to figure them out, okay? So he really was the greatest scientist of all time, but Notice, he would not spare a moment from the teaching of the knowledge of the science of salvation. His time, his faculties, his life itself was appreciated and used only as the means of working out the salvation of the souls of men. He would not be turned from his one object. He allowed nothing to divert him. Every fountain was sealed, save the fountain of eternal life. To me, that's an extremely profound statement. And if Christ, the greatest scientist of all, shut up every fountain of science for the sake of focusing on eternal life, what's the most important thing in the world? Focusing on eternal life. There is nothing more important than salvation. And we in our churches and in our businesses and in our activities, 
should not be spending so much time worrying about other things except the salvation of souls. Christ imparted only that knowledge which could be utilized to those who were so eager to pluck from the tree of knowledge. And there were those who were telling him, explain this, explain that those. To those who were so eager to pluck from the tree of knowledge, he offered the fruit of the tree of life. They found every avenue closed except the narrow way that leads to God. Every fountain was sealed except the fountain to eternal life. In the golden censer of truth, as presented in Christ's teachings, we have that which will convict and convert souls. Do not present theories or tests that Christ has never mentioned and that have no foundation in the Bible. Wow, that is kind of profound, isn't it? That's really profound. If Jesus didn't talk about it, why are you talking about it? If it's not clearly outlined in the Bible, why are you dealing with it? Our business is the salvation of souls. Not the tweaking of energy spots or energy paths or talent channeling or anything like that. Our sole business as a church is the salvation of souls. And Christ, who is the greatest scientist, could have explained everything to us. He refused to. Because the only business that sinful, dead, and dying people need to know is the life that comes through Jesus Christ. That's all we need to know. And if it's not in Jesus' teaching, and if it's not in the Bible, we don't need to worry about it. We don't need to mess with it. Christ foresaw the delusive doctrines that would fill the world but he did not unfold them. In his teachings, he dwelt upon the unchangeable principles of God's Word. A very important principle here. Jesus knew of all of the delusive doctrines. Why didn't he tell us about them? We don't need to know them. We only need to know his Word. Let a people glory in wealth, intellect, knowledge, or anything but Christ and they will soon be brought to confusion. And the emphasis here is on knowledge. There is a lot of intellect and a lot of knowledge, and a lot of people like to bring that in and to say, well, hey, pay attention. I know something. I've, I know something of science. I know something of medicine. I know something that's really unique. Hey, if it's anything but Christ, you're going to be confused. Psalms 119, 105, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Christ calls upon his people to believe and practice his word. Those who receive and assimilate this word, making it a part of every action, every attribute of character, will grow strong in the strength of God. They will not wander into what? Oh, there are a lot of strange paths out there, folks. And how do we avoid stumbling into a strange path? You avoid it by assimilating believing and practicing the Word of God. It is written as sufficient. We have grand and solemn truths to present. It is written, is the test that must be brought home to every soul. Let us go to the Word of God for guidance. Let us seek for a, thus saith the Lord. We have had enough of what? It's a human idea. doesn't matter whether it's Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, whether it's Ronald Reagan or Rush Limbaugh or whoever it is. Hey, those are all human ideas, folks. We don't need human ideas. If we want to judge a work, know what needs to be done, let's look for a thus saith the Lord. Let's look for a it is written. And that, that will get us there. Study Revelation. The solemn messages that have been given in their order in the Revelation are to occupy the first place in the minds of God's people. Nothing else is to be allowed to engross our attention. Here is no guesswork, no what? Here are all the truths that concern our present and future welfare. What is the chaff to the wheat? The Bible first and last. Take heed, brethren and sisters. Who is your leader, Christ or the angel that fell from heaven? Notice we only have those two options. 
Examine yourselves and know whether you are sound in the faith. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. We have a Bible full of the most precious truth. It contains the what? Alpha and Omega of knowledge. We don't need to know anything else except what's in the Bible, folks. If it's written in the Bible, it's for our salvation. The Bible is the Word of God. Let us focus on the Bible. And if somebody says, oh, I've got a new idea, I've got a new practice, I've got a new concept, got a new theory, hey, the Bible is the Alpha and Omega of all the knowledge that we need. And it's the only knowledge that we need. Medical missionary work. Interesting. Because here we're talking about medical therapies and the like, when all of our medical missionaries live new life in Christ, when they take his word as their guide, they'll have a much clearer understanding of what constitutes genuine medical missionary work. Bible, our only guide. The Lord's philosophy, plainly outlined in his word, is to be the rule of life. The entire being is to be under the control of the one who knows the end from the beginning. The Bible and the Bible only is to be our guide. The truth of God is found in His Word. Those who feel that they must seek, it, uh, seek elsewhere for present truth need to be converted all over again. As they abandon their human ideas and take up their God-given duties, beholding Christ and becoming conformed to His likeness, they say, Nearer my God to thee, nearer to thee. As the Spirit of God becomes better known, the Bible will be accepted as what? Only foundation is exactly. And spirit of prophecy. We must follow the directions given through the spirit of prophecy. We must love and obey the truth for this time. This will save us from what? Accepting strong delusions. That means what? There are strong delusions there. There are strong delusions all about us. They are getting stronger every day. And as we understand the truth for this time, we will avoid strong delusions. Now, let's talk a little bit more about truth. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. If you're not promoting the truth, what are you doing to the truth? You're suppressing the truth. And I can tell you that truth is being suppressed all around us all the time by ungodly people who may be very intelligent, and they may be scientists, they may be eloquent, but truth is being suppressed. The testing truth for this time is not the fabrication of any human mind. It's from God. Truth and error are similar. Many things will be presented that appear to be true, yet they need to be carefully considered with much prayer, for they may be what? Specious, Specious devices of the enemy. The path of error often appears close to the path of truth. We are not doing the will of God when we speculate upon things that he has seen fit to withhold from us. What we need to inquire at this time is, what is the truth that will enable us to win the salvation of our souls? So there's all kinds of things that are going on going around, and we can speculate. Somebody say, oh, this is really good. You need this. This will help you. This will heal you. This will benefit you. But what we really need to do is to say, does it affect the salvation of my soul? And if it doesn't affect the salvation of my soul, I don't want to have anything to do with it. I only want knowledge that's going to make me holier. I only want knowledge that's going to bring me closer to God. I don't need to know about this aspect or that aspect. What I need to know is, is my soul secure with God? At this time, God's message to the world is to be given with such prominence and power that the people will be brought face to face mind to mind, heart to heart, with what? Truth. They must be brought to see its superiority over the multitudinous errors that are pushing their way into notice to supplant, if possible, the work of God for this time. Now notice, how, uh, how many truths are there? One. There's one truth. How many errors are there? Multitudinous. And so what we have is a solid rock of truth. And the devil's trying to, to move it. And he's got a wedge on this side and a lever on this side and a crowbar on this side. And he's trying to burn it on that side. And he's trying to dissolve it on this side and trying to wash it away on this side and trying to blow it away on that side. See what I mean? And truth is being attacked from all sides. 
and it's being attacked by multitudinous errors that are pushing their way in. And so our job is to focus on the truth and to try to identify all of these multitudinous errors and to avoid them. Because if it doesn't have something to do with the salvation of our soul, we don't need to know about it. Keep the truth pure. Sacred things are not to be mingled with the common. What is the chaff to the wheat? A voice should be heard crying, If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Now we're going to have a few quotes about Satan and Satan's methods. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeing whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So we have to be vigilant. We have to be wide awake. We need to be sober, because the devil's trying to get us. He's trying to divert us from our salvation. Diversion is Satan's tactic. The mastermind in the confederacy of evil is ever working to keep out of sight the words of God and to bring into full view the opinions of men. He means that we shall not hear the voice of God saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it. So this is how the devil works. He inspires certain men with certain ideas, and often their names are attached to their products, manipulations, or theories. And... He says, pay attention to these, because these are interesting things. But to the extent that you spend time thinking about those things, you are not thinking about God. And your mind, you, your mind can't think about nothing. But if we're not thinking about God, we're thinking about what? Something else. Isn't that right? I have a, I have a saying that I'll apply. I, 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 I'm in the field of medicine, as you know. And I never charged anybody very much money. My wife was always disappointed in that. And <laughs> as, as a result, I never made a lot of money. But hey, I, I made enough money. Doctors really do well. And uh, I had friends that made three, four, five times as much money. I didn't envy them in, in the least. But I've learned something that's really true. And that is, to the extent that a doctor thinks about money, he's a bad doctor. Money divert you from thinking about what's good for the patient. I'd have patients ask me, doctor, how much is this going to cost? And I said, whoa, I hadn't thought about that. I don't know. Let's talk about it later. My job is save your life. You know? And what does money have to do with saving your life? It has nothing to do with saving your life. And so I'm going to just take care of you, all right? And we'll work out the money thing later. Let's, let's not worry about it. But I've had doctors come in and say, hey, you need to have your prostate operated on. And as soon as you give me $1,500, I'll do it. Which is meaning what? What comes first? Money. Yeah, to the extent that a doctor thinks about money, to that extent, he's a bad doctor. Remember that. It'll save your life someday. But this is what it's talking about here. The devil is, to, is trying to keep out of sight the words of God and to bring into our view the opinions of men. And he's hoping that if he can keep us focused on the opinions of men, that we won't hear the, this is the way, walk ye in it. I say to all, be on your guard, for as an angel of light, Satan is walking in every assembly of Christian workers, and in what? Oh, wow. We're happy because we have the angels of the Lord there on Sabbath, right? We've got the Holy Spirit there. Do you ever stop to think that you've got the devil in your church? You've got the devil in your church. Every church has the devil in it. And what's he trying to do? trying to win members to his side. I am bidden to give the people of God the warning, what? Be not deceived. Satan's new tricks in the future. Satan's superstitions will assume new forms. Hey, this is brand new. We just discovered this. This is really important stuff. We have an understanding that we've never had before. Errors will be presented in a pleasing and flattering manner. False theories closed in garments of light will be presented to God's people. Thus, Satan will try to deceive as possible the very elect. So we need to look in our churches, see what's going on, see if the devil's got something starting out there, and if so, we've got to weed it out. Satan's devices. By every device at his command, Satan seeks to prevent men from obtaining that knowledge of God, which is what? Salvation. 
we are living in an age of great light, but much of that that is called light is opening the way for the wisdom and arts of what? Satan. Satan. Yeah. Hey, I've got light. I've got new light. This is really great stuff. You've got to pay attention to it. It's wonderful. What is it? It's delusion of Satan. You've got to identify it. Get rid of it. Satan uses false science. False science is one of the agencies that Satan used in the heavenly courts. Oh, did th uh, this was a revelation to me. How did he win the angels over to his side? He did it with scientific arguments. And I bet it was the same argument he gave Eve. Hey, guys, look at us. We're kowtowing all the time. You know, we've been happy doing it. It's because we've been too stupid to think of the alternative. We are actually like God ourselves. Now, I mean, those created people that we've seen down there, I mean, they, they need God's rules. I mean, he's made them the way they are. But hey, we are higher beings, we are higher beings than we've been assigned. And the truth is, we don't need these constraints. And let me prove it to you scientifically. Okay? Let's do this experiment. False science is the agency that Satan used in heavenly courts, and it's used by him what? Today. The false assertions that he made to the angels, his subtle what? Scientific theory seduced many of them from their loyalties. I mean, it wasn't a just, uh, it wasn't a popularity contest. It wasn't a beauty contest. Don't you think I'm as good looking as Christ? Don't you think that, you know, I could do as well as he? Listen, I, don't you agree I've got a good voice? I mean, it wasn't that kind of an argument. It was a scientific argument. It was, hey, they're stuck in four dimensions down there. And we actually have seven dimensions ourselves. God came, claims to have 11. But the truth is, we're stuck in seven because we think we have seven. The truth is, we probably have nine or 10. The truth is, God is, has kept us down. And scientifically speaking, I'll prove to you that we're more than we are said to be. I think. These kinds of scientific arguments won the angels over. Satan snares, let every soul be on the alert. The adversaries on your track be vigilant, watching diligently, lest some carefully concealed and masterly snare shall take you unawares. These are all beginning to sound the same, aren't they? And, and if I've given you too many of them, I'm sorry. But... Uh, they all have subtle shades of different meaning to them. He who overcomes must watch. For with worldly entanglements, error, and superstition, Satan strives to win Christ's followers from him. Unless we are constantly on guard, we shall fall an easy prey to his unnumbered deception. How many deceptions does he have? Unnumbered. Fred was talking about superstitions this morning. Superstitions about food. You know, oh, it's hot, it's cold. It's all superstition. We need to free ourselves of all of these kinds of superstitions. Exclude Satan science. Let not the institutions ordained by God to send out life-giving truth be made an agency for the dissemination of soul-destroying error. Let it be understood by all with whom we have to do that from all our institutions, literature containing the science of Satan is excluded. Now, I put this in. This had to do with the publishing work. And uh, in the late 1800s, before the Review and Herald burned down, they began to accept commercial work. And Mrs. White actually approved that. She said com some commercial work is perfectly appropriate because it will put us in with other publishing houses. We can take their overflow, and it'll let them know that we're a legitimate business, and it's perfectly all right to do. But then they began to uh, uh, accept work that... Uh, we shouldn't be publishing. And uh, she made a long list of them. She said, now, why are you publishing uh, uh, things having to do with crime? We don't want to tell people about crime. We want to tell people about the Lord. Then she said, why do we want to publish things having to do with uh, sentimentality, love stories? Why are we doing love stories? Uh, people's love lives are screwed up, and we don't, wanna, we don't want to encourage them in any way. 
And then she really got on her high horse about spiritualistic. She says, why are we publishing stuff that has spiritualistic sort of things in it? And she says, that really has to stop. And I think that we could apply this not only to the publishing work, but to churches and hospitals and things like that. Let not the institutions ordained, ordained by God send out life-giving truth, be made an agency for the di dissemination of soul-destroying error. So in our churches, we need to really look, what are our churches really about? Our, our churches are really about the salvation of souls. And if we're doing anything else other than the salvation of souls, we have wandered from the purpose and the same warnings that were given to the publishing work will certainly apply to our churches and to our hospitals and to doctor's offices and our homes as well. Now, I, I thought that, uh, and uh, we'll catch another thought about the publishing work here in a second or two. Perilous times are before us. Everyone who has a knowledge of the truth should awake, place himself, body, soul, and spirit under the discipline of God. The enemy is on our track. We must be wide awake to guard against him. I see no reason why the opinions of worldly wise men should be trusted and, in, and exalted. How can those who are destitute of divine enlightenment have correct ideas and, uh, of God's plans and ways? I, I thought that here is a nice contrast between the, uh, the right and the wrong. Avoid spurious and erroneous ideas. I beseech those who are laboring for God not to accept spurious for the genuine. Let not human reason be placed where divine sanctified truth should be. Let not erroneous theories receive countenance from the people who ought to be standing firm on the platform of eternal truth. God calls upon us to hold firmly to the fundamental principles that are based upon unquestionable authorities. I thought this was interesting. Do not forget that he is to be our pattern in all things. We may what? safely discard those ideas that are not found in his teaching. Beware how you follow impulse, calling it the Holy Spirit. That's an interesting one, isn't it? If it's not found in his teaching, what can we, we can safely what? All right, we can discard it. It's not in the Bible, throw it away. New way is a great deception. Men may suppose that they found a new way and that they can lay a stronger foundation than that which has been laid. But this is a great deception. Other foundation can no man lay than that which has been laid. Satanic agencies are clothing false theories in what? An attractive garb. And what makes it attractive? Well, it flatters your senses. It may make you feel better. Even as Satan in the Garden of Eden concealed his identity from our first parents, these agencies are instilling into human minds that which is deadly error. Those who continue to hold these spiritualistic theories will surely spoil their Christian experience, sever their connection with God, and lose eternal life. That's sad. So, if we start out with a spiritualistic theory, and we, we think it's working really good for us, and it's enhancing our experience and what's happening in our church, it says it'll soon spoil our Christian experience. That's the first thing. Spoiling is what? Gets dirty. Then what happens to our connection with God? Severed. And what happens to our eternal life? Down the drain. Already there are coming in among our people spiritualistic teachings that undermine the faith of those who give heed to them. The theory that God is in essence pervading all of nature is one of Satan's most subtle devices. Then I thought this was really good. There is a science of Christianity, and I, I've numbered them, and I've added the numbering just so that we would get them correct. There is a science of Christianity to be mastered. So this is what we're supposed to be focusing on, folks. This is the science of Christianity, and this is what we should be spending our time doing. One, the mind is to be disciplined, educated, and trained in what? Service for God. Number two, hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil must what? Be overcome. And this is interesting because I, I deal with a lot of gay people in my practice, and their big uh, point is that it's natural. They have found out that it's natural. And, uh, and, it, it, and it's hereditary. And, uh, and you know, uh, is it? I don't know. Maybe it is. I don't care. Uh, is alcoholism hereditary? Sure. Children of alcoholics are more likely to become alcoholic. And, um, 
And we would say that if you were born with it, you're stuck with it and you can't change it, you know? Not true. Uh, dozens of times in her writings, Mrs. White says, hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil must be overcome. So if you were born with it, you need to change it. And it doesn't matter whether it's your lifestyle, whether it's alcoholism or what. All right, number three. Often the training and education of a lifetime must be what? Yeah, why? Has no relevance to your salvation. Number four, our hearts must be educated to become what? Steadfast in God. That means day in, day out. We are to form habits of thoughts that will enable us to resist temptation. We must learn to look upward, number six. And seven, the principles of the Word of God must be applied to our what? Daily. You live by the Bible every day. day in, that's the science of Christianity right there. Seven steps, seven perfect steps, comes from uh, Testimonies, Volume 8, page 314. Accepting new theories does not bring new life to the soul. Soul-destroying theories. Let not work setting forth the soul-destroying theories of hypnotism, spiritualism, Romanism, or other mysteries of iniquity find a place in our publishing houses. Avoid errors when found. If you love and fear God, refuse to have anything to do with the knowledge against which God warned Adam. Now, this is going back to the uh, publishing business. And uh, she was saying, okay, I understand how some of those books got in there. The manager accepted the job. And when the manager accepted the job, then it flows through the whole plant, right? Notice what she says. As you love and fear God, refuse to have anything to do with knowledge against which God warned Adam. Number one, let typesetters refuse to set a sentence of that such matter. So if you're a typesetter, and you see something come along that doesn't have to do with God, hey, stop, walk out. Number two, let proofreaders refuse to read it. If you're reading something and you proofread it and say, oh, hey, that's, that's heretical, that's against God's belief. Proofreader, stop reading right there. Do not read another word. We're not going to do that here in this publishing house. Next, let pressmen refuse to print. Say you're up there running this paper through. You go down to see how it is. You look at the proof, see if the ink is smudgy. You read something. It's not right. Stop the presses. The press is not supposed to roll. Let binders refuse to bind it. If you make it all the way through, and it's been through the proofreader, the typesetter, and the printer, and you're a binder, and you're putting it into the book, and you start looking at it, and you say, oh, that's error. Stop binding those books right then and there. That's interesting, isn't it? Do you, do you think she, she didn't say, let the job go through and just don't do it again, did she? No. And so who is responsible in the publishing house to see who? Everybody. All right. In your church, if you see error, Whose responsibility is to face up to it? Everybody. It does not fall just to the pastor or to the elder. My word would be if the, if the elder catches something that's wrong, the elder should say something. If he fails to do it, if the deacon sees that something's wrong, the deacon should say something. If the deacon doesn't do it and a Sabbath school teacher sees something, the Sabbath school teacher should say something about it. And if you're just a church member that was baptized last year and you're sitting in the last row and you don't know anybody's name and you see something that's wrong, it's still your responsibility to say something because you're a member of the household of God. And he expects you to recognize error where it comes up and to say and to do something about it. And here is an in love. Guard our physical senses. You are responsible, responsible for the use of your eyes, your hands, your mind. These are entrusted to you by God to be used for him, not for the service of Satan. Now notice, we're just down to our last couple of slides here. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, they will turn their ears away from the truth, and will be turned aside to fables. But you, be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. That's Paul's closing words to Timothy, probably the last words that he ever wrote that we have a record of. And he wanted him to preach, convince, but then he said rebuke and exhort. And so the last couple of sides have to do with kind of rebuking. 
When errors come into our ranks, we are not to enter into controversy over them. Huh, that's interesting, isn't it? Let's not enter into controversy over them. We are faithfully to give the message of what? Huh. And then we are to lead the minds of the people away from fanciful, erroneous ideas, presenting the truth in contrast with error. So, you're not to argue with people, right? Controversy means yelling, screaming, kicking. Not supposed to do that, but we are supposed to rebuke. And so we rebuke, but then what do we do? We use the word of God, presenting the truth in contrast to error. So we rebuke, and we say, that's not right. Here's what the Bible says. Don't enter into controversy. By controversy, you dignify, defend and rebuke. Truth must be defended. And the kingdom of God advanced as it would be if Christ in person were on this earth. If he were here, he would be drawn out to rebuke many, though professing to be medical missionaries, have not chosen to learn of the great medical missionary, his meekness and his lowliness. Whoa, 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 whoa. That re that's interesting, isn't it? Because there are a lot of healing ministries among us. And some of them are better than others. Some of them are more, more Christ-based than others. Some of them are more biblically based than others. But if Christ were here, he did more healing than preaching. It says he would be drawn out to rebuke. Many, who though professing to be medical missionaries, have not chosen to learn of the great medical missionary, his meekness and his lowliness. There are times when words of reproof and rebuke are called for. Those who are out of the right way must be aroused to see their peril. A, mus a message must be given that shall startle them from their lethargy which enchains their senses. So... We, we, we don't like to rebuke or reprove people, and especially if we're in a postmodern society that says, my truth is as valid as your proof. Don't impose your proof upon us. Don't tell me to accept your truth. But the truth is we have one church. It's God's true church, and we believe that he's coming back to take us, and there is no room in our ranks for error. And your truth is not just as valid as my truth. My truth is not my truth, it's God's truth. And I stand on my truth because it's true and it's validated and it's in the word of God. And if your truth doesn't match my truth, I reprove you for that. We do it in love. And I'll close with this one. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness and what accord has Christ with Belial. Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the, little of, uh, of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Don't touch what is unclean. And I will receive you. I will be a father to you. And you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty.